All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Esperanza Sanchez. I'm the Associate Curator here at La Plaza Cultura y Artes and the Curator of Patriotism and Conflict. I'm also here, followed with three amazing women and also Priscilla Leva here as well. So I'm gonna take a moment to introduce uh, our three panelists and our co-moderators for the evening. I have Gloria Arianes to my left. She was born in East Los Angeles in 1946 and was raised in El Monte, California. Her father was a first-generation Mexican-American whose family migrated to the United States from Chihuahua, Mexico, and her mother was of Tongva Native American descent. In the 1950s and the 1960s, El Monte experienced extreme racial tension, especially throughout her high school years. During her time with the Brown Berets, uh, Gloria Arianes attended many major Chicano movement events, including the Poor People's Campaign in Washington, D.C., East L.A. blowouts, known as the Walkouts, and both the Denver Youth Conferences. In the early 1970s, after years of mistreatment and sexism uh, in the Brown Berets, the female uh, members decided to separate from the Brown Berets, and there, Gloria Arianes, and along with these females, uh, organized the Adelitas de Aslan, which is a women's group that started also another free clinic called La Clinica del Barrio. Um, Gloria Arianes was involved in the Chicano Moratorium, uh, which was a large anti-Vietnam War uh, protest and civil rights demonstrations that we will discuss in detail in our exhibition. Um, Gloria Arianes was also on stage when the violence uh, broke out, and she was not only tear gassed, and uh, recovered physically, but was emo emotionally scarred for many years by what she had witnessed that day. Since the movement years, uh, Gloria has reconnected not only with her Native American heritage, but she's now an elder in the Tonka tribe, and she has served as the Secretary of Tribal Council and is part of an indigenous grandmother group as well. She's raised two sons while she was a single mother, and she now has a grandson and granddaughter, and she's worked on multiple sacred sites uh, especially environmental issues and to protect the Mother Earth and water. So, thank you so much, Gloria, for being here. And uh, to the left of Gloria Arianes, we have Elena Dominguez, who was 25 years old when her sister Yolanda Sanchez brought her to a Brown Berets party. There, um, in that event, she also uh, went to the Brown Berets headquarters, and this is where she met Gloria Arianes, and it was a source of inspiration. And then at the UCLA Metro Conference, she met Irene Tavar, which is to her left, uh, and made her feel inspired to be a woman, but also Gloria made her feel proud to be a Chicana woman as well. Uh, Elena Dominguez belongs to the Latina Elder Groups and has been part of it for the last 25 years. She's also part of the Chicana Cholas and Chisme Writing Group uh, for the last eight years, which is part of Paso 101. So thank you, Elena, for being here tonight. And we have Irene Tovar to our left as well, is the Chief Executive Officer of the Latin American Civil Rights Association a nonprofit multifamily service agency which focuses on affordable housing uh, and is also part of the California State University of Northridge alumni where she dis she received a Distinguished Alumni Award and was part of a Trailblazer uh, highest award given to any alumni at the time. In 2019, she was appointed to CSUN's Diversity and Inclusive Commission uh, by the CSUN President and was chair of the CSUN Alumni Association. Uh, she also served for eight years under Governor Jerry Brown uh, for the administration as the first Mexican-American to be appointed to the state personal board and as president of the instrumental in implementation of policies and procedures that removed artificial barriers in the state and civil service system, um, including differential pay and affirmative action. And she's also served as a full-time board um, of the State and Public Employment Relations Board and in 1974, she was president of the LA City Civil Service Commission. In 1971, was a board member of the LA Urban Coalition and United Way. And in 2001, served as a member of the LA City Redistricting Commission. And for 13 years, was a member and then chair of the LA City Proposition Q Citizen Oversight Committee from 2000 to 2013. She's also the founder of the LA Mission College and is on the advisory board. 
And Ms. Torga has also served in various Mexican, Latino, and intergroup organizations where she received multiple awards in her community, including um, May 2nd, she was recommended for the Latino Spirit Award from the California Legislative Latino Caucus. And on May 22nd, she will also receive an honorary doctorate degree from CSUN as well. And here to my right, I have Dr. Priscilla Leva, who is an assistant professor at the Chicana and Latino Studies at Loyola Marymount University. Her research interests include relations with ethnic studies, urban history, sports history, and in particular, as it relates to places, placemaking, and community formation. She's also the co-founder of the Chavez Ravine and Unfinished Story, a community-engaged oral history and archival project that documents the long history of this payment and its aftermath in Los Angeles. So thank you all for being here tonight, and I will pass it along to my co-moderator. I just want to say thank you so much for allowing us to be in your presence today. This is an incredible honor, I think, for, for all of us and just to, you know, we teach we teach about you all and we read about you all, but it's just so nice to see you in the flesh and to hear the stories from your voices. Um, and so, I, you know, I was thinking a lot about the questions that our, my students tend to have when we, when we talk about the movement. And so I was wondering if you could just tell us each about how um, how, what drew you to activism? How did you first get involved in, in thinking about these issues and acting on them? I can start. Um, it started in high school for me. Uh, now let me back up a little bit more. When I was about eight years old, I remember coming home and telling my, my dad, my dad, the school says I'm American. He says, no, you're not, you're Chicano. I go to my dad, I'm American. He said, no, you're Chicano. And I cried. Why were they confusing me? Who's lying to me? Um, so I grew up Chicana, okay? And then I went to uh, uh, visit one of my co my mother's cousins. And she showed me genealogy, books that were written by an uncle, that we were California Mission Indians, okay? And so my mom never told me that. You know? My dad, you know, never told me that. So I went back home and I told my mom, I must have been a teenager, I think, at that time. Mom, your cousin says we're Indian. She goes, don't ever say you're an Indian, you're a Mexican. Don't ever say you're an Indian. And that was because they were punished. Now I know. And that was her way of protecting me. So I grew up as a Chicana again. <laughs> so, uh, but in high school, I'm very tall. I weighed a lot. I was very overweight, uh, close to 300 pounds. So I was very big. And people bullied me. We didn't call it bullying in those days. It was being picked on. And that made me kind of a fighter, you know, to defend myself. You know, I, I was very mouthy. They were afraid of me. I was going to kill them or something. You can <laughs> sit on them or something. <laughs> so that just kind of made me, you know, not to crap from anybody. Sorry. But you know, that's it. So after I graduated, I went, went into a... Well, we started a concert in high school because we had race riots, the whites versus uh, the Chicanos. And only the Chicanos would get arrested. So there again, I started becoming very, you know, aware of racism. Almani is known for having the Nazi party there. So it was the Chicano dream to go, you know, go step at the building or, you know, call them out and, you know, just yell at them. Um, and you know, all of that, you know, El Monte was just a real racist town. I, the history I've learned about it, it was called uh, the end of the Santa Fe Trail. We have found that is a, a, not a truth. Uh, they were not, you know, people in covered wagons, but they were invaders, you know. And um, we are, I'm with a group right now. We designed our city hall to reflect the how, what El Monte really represents. Not a covered wagon, not the Monte boys that were uh, uh, a vigilante group. And there's a, a story I grew up with that there was a mention of a Mexican woman, the mention of Juana Maria. Nobody has been able to verify that. So I don't know where I got that and, and all that. My parents, when they bought a house, we came from the Maravilla Projects when I was five years old until I'm And um, my dad was very light skinned. And my mom was, you know, beautiful brown, black, black hair, you know, the, the native woman, the indigenous woman. 
um, my dad had hands and legs. So he got a home in El Monte on his GI benefits. Last day he took my mother, they were going to get the keys because he had gone through escort and get the keys. When they saw my mother, they tried to take it back and say, I'm, we're sorry, but it's, you know, it's not going to go through. It's not necessary. My father said, do you think I'm stupid? I understand. I own this house now. Give me the keys or I'll own half the city. You know, I'll see you. So what I found out, like maybe six years ago, uh, through the South Armani Arts Posse, you know, mommy that I am a, uh, uh, like a consultant to them. And um, they said there was a law that people of color could not own property in our money. And I understand that was kind of all over. You know, it wasn't just our money. But it just, that's just kind of sets a tone for what I grew up in, that environment. I was having to defend yourself. When we'd walk home from high school, people would yell at us. And guys of white people, white men would come by yelling at us and throwing stuff at us, you know. Uh, so when I graduated from high school, I got into the YTAP program, Youth Training and Employment Project, but went into the anti poverty program. And so that kind of gave me, you know, ideas, you know, to be of service. So then we were cruising Little Radio Boulevard one night, <laughs> and uh, we were invited to go to the Garden of Coffee House. And when we got there, it was dark, so we said, we're not going in there. And they said, no, it's safe, really, it's safe. There, there's people in there. And we couldn't see people, right? Because <laughs> you know we were there. <laughs> so what was happening was in shape. But we went in, and yeah, there were people in there, and it was a coffee house, just about to end. And what everybody would do is, that the sheriffs would go by and put the floodlights in there, so everybody would do this. And I'm like, what's going on? What, what's going to happen here? <laughs> <laughs> and they asked me, do you want to join? They were talking things I had never heard, very radical, very militant, very, we're going to take charge, you know, we're going to stop the police brutality and, you know, all these things. Um, so this was all just very different. I had not heard people talking like that. So it took me three visits. And they would ask me, are you ready to join? I go, I'm not yet, not yet. And I had Andrea and Esther Sanchez with me. And they came from Santa Fe Springs. And um, on the third time, I said, yes, I'll join. And from there, you know, it was a boundary. So that's how I think I got into all this. I, I wasn't aware about, I never heard the term Chicana until I met Gloria. And uh, as I was growing up, I remember when I was in kindergarten, I remember the teacher said, our forefathers came on the Mayflower. So I thought my forefathers came on the Mayflower. So then anyway, I didn't understand why my grandfather would, would always say, you have to be proud, you're a Mexican. And then I would think, okay. And then, um, he would tell us stories about the 1910 revolution. He had been an orphan, and and uh, I believe he was about maybe seven, eight years old. And he, the Catholic nuns would pick up the orphan Mexican orphan orphans and take them to the church, and of course, you know, try to brainwash them. Anyway, uh, that's what I think. And um, I remember he would tell us that they would mistreat him. And then he, I asked him why. He goes, because of my skin color, because he was Moreno. And I, I didn't understand. So anyway, as life went on, um, I didn't want to relate with our Mexican history because I remember in junior high school, they would say that um, uh, 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 Villa and Zapata were bandits and thieves. I didn't want to be a bandit or a thief. So then, uh, and then I remember they would, uh, really talk bad about the Native Americans. So I was like, well, who the heck am I? So then anyway, when I was 25 years old, my sister invited me to a, to a Grand Parade party in Hollywood. And at that time, I did not know I had assimilated. I changed my name from Elena to Helen. 
I, I dyed my beautiful brown hair to blonde. And then uh, at that time I was hanging around on Sunset Boulevard, going hitting the clubs and all that stuff. And then um, when I went to this party, I was like seeing these people with brown berets hat on and, and uh, uh, the beige jackets on. And I told my sister, what the hell did you bring me to? And then she said, just enjoy it. So then when she says enjoy it, all of a sudden these big old six feet policemen come in and they start beating the hell out of us with, uh, with their billy clubs and so forth. The next thing I know, I'm in, in the Hollywood jail and I'm telling her, I cabrona, now why did you bring me here? So then that's when I learned about police brutality. That's when I learned about racism because I remember telling the policeman, I have to pee, you have to pee. He puts a, a coffee cup paper cup he goes here do it in here and I felt like doing it throwing the pee in his face but anyway um, from there I remember um, going to different uh, um, boycotts and stuff like that and like the, the Cesar Chavez's farm workers and then I remember uh, I went to the Medchap conference at UCLA and then that's when I when I met uh, Irene and she was so inspirational, I was like, oh, I'm so happy I'm a woman. So anyway, as life goes on, I ended up um, deciding I was going to be a teacher. So I went to East LA College, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to study. And then uh, I'm not sure, I, I don't know, but I ended up uh, uh, majoring in Mexican-American studies. That's what they used to teach us at that time. And then from there, I got more involved in the movimiento, um, the walkouts, all that stuff. And, uh, and uh, what ended up happening was um, I went, I transferred to Cal State. And then there, at that time, they changed it to Chicano Studies. And uh, I'm just so fortunate for these two women because they taught me to be proud that I'm Chicana, that I'm Mexicana, that I'm a woman. And what ended up happening was um, I ended up getting into a, a, being an activist for women's rights and, and, and so forth, right? And then um, what ended up happening was that I became a uh, community worker. And I started working out in the community and so forth. And different agencies I worked with was to help the people, you know, help them to get out of the the rut that they allowed the, the environment to get them into and and let them know that they have rights and that to don't give up, you know, to don't give up on themselves, don't give up on their families, and especially don't give up on their children. And it's very important. I used to tell them, let them know about their culture, let them know about their tradition, okay? Because we don't want to lose the children. And I believe that's one of the reasons why so many children not just Mexicano, Chicanos, but, you know, Asian Americans, Blacks, and so forth, because they did not learn about their culture, about their tradition, to be proud of it. And that's, for me, that was the, the main thing that I learned from the movie, Mianto, to be proud who you are. Thank you. The question is, how did I get involved? You know that I cannot remember? Because, because it seems like I always was involved. Uh, and I think I got to attribute this to my parents. Both of my parents were born in Mexico. One of them left at the beginning of the Mexican Revolution. Uh, my father lived through it all. So he got to see all the injustices that occurred and how a government can turn against its own people. And my father was my best teacher. He was my first history teacher because he told me about justice. He told me, like my mother believed, that the human being was the most precious and most valuable, most valuable thing in this universe. And that we had to do everything possible to preserve that dignity and to make sure we protect it. So as a young girl who absorbed it like a sponge, it affected me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so it affected 
my life and saw the world. So when I went to elementary school, I was born in Los Angeles. By the way, my sister and I were baptized in this church right here. <laughs> How interesting life is, isn't it? And when I went to elementary school, my father and mother had taught me already about how proud I should be in a Mexican. A Mexican, okay? And because at that time, the word Mexican was a dirty word, okay? If you were, and there's a reason why I really believe. And I'll tell you this story, which led me to feel later on why I even became a, an adult, as an adult. When we went to Pacoima Elementary, which the only, at that time, that area was the only area that they allowed minorities to live, okay? And it was a crime, and I say a crime, if a child, they were by, spoke Spanish. They punished the child. There was, if you spoke Spanish, either in the playground, on the hall, or in your room, or the classroom, you were punished. If you were a girl, you stood in front of your fellow classmate, pick up a, a, a child, and they would say, okay, Margarita, speak up. They would say they brought her in front of the other students. And they said, Margarita, lift yes. up your hand. Why are you being punished? And she would, in a very low, embarrassing voice, say, because I spoke Spanish. And they, she would get a ruler and hit the young girl in the hand. Now, if you were a boy, Mr. Shepherd, and I'll never forget Mr. Shepherd, Mr. Shepherd would be the disciplinary for the boys. And what he would do is get the boy, have him bend down with a head against the wall, and then with a pedal, hit the little boy as hard as he could on his tush. So guess what? His head bounced against the wall. And that was a reminder that Spanish was a dirty word. Okay? That was a time when burrito, kids wait burrito, were made fun of. Think of the irony, right? In present day. And so what happened is the kids started thinking, okay? I was humiliated against because I spoke Spanish. Okay, I was punished. I better not speak Spanish. I mean Spanish because I will be punished. And there must be something terrible about Spanish, but also to why are my parents speaking Spanish? So you started being embarrassed, at least of your parents, okay? And so that generation of, of young people ended up being the ones that did not want their children to speak Spanish who were embarrassed of who, they, who their ancestors were. I was so fortunate and I was so blessed because I had fathers and mothers that from the very beginning made with me that there was a history in, in, in a contribution, that there were artists of all talent in Mexico from the classics to the mariachi, you want to call it nowadays, okay? And that there was art uh, and, and all those things, and I absorbed it, I, I lifted it, it was real to me. And so I ended up being proud, not arrogant by the way, my parents wanted to make sure that we didn't convert it to arrogant, to be proud of who we were. That it was, you know, that you shouldn't be embarrassed by the color of your skin, morenita. Haven't some of your parents or fathers called you, I mean morenita, or oh, I mean negrita in compliments to who you were. So I didn't feel that something about my skin that it was wrong. And so fast forward when I was in high school, another story with the educational system, okay? In San Fernando High School, uh, if you went to San Fernando High School, there was a club for the, the for those Chicanos that got the high grades. You were, if you were a boy, you were in the Caballeros. If you were a girl, you were in the Zapatillas. But you never belonged to the white clubs that hide the students who had to train. They were the ladies for the young girl, and they were the knights, okay? And all that I resented, or didn't like, maybe resented is not the right word. And so therefore, I wanted to show that we were capable of doing it. So 
I was participating in, in the stream body. I had good grades. I had almost, you know, but think about it. At that time, there was a test called the Iowa test, and it happened nationwide. And it took a whole week to, to, to take. And you, you were tested on science, math, history, etc. And I came out in the 10% of the nation. I didn't get any scholarship. No counselor ever yeah, got a hold of me and told me, listen, this is how you go to college. This is what you have to be aware of. This is what will happen to you. I didn't lose it. So I, I went one day. That was registration. I don't, I don't even remember how I got that information. Scared it could be to go to get, you know, to get my college education, which I wanted. Again, I know it's a difference because of my, of what I had been told to do. The most valuable thing in this universe was a human being. And we had to do everything possible to protect its dignity and, and make sure that we, in some way or the other, played a role in making our history known, our possibility that we could be anything we wanted, okay? which I saw lacking in some of my fellow classmates. Some of them were much, much further, brighter than I was, and they dropped out of school because of how lack of confidence in themselves, lack of pride in who they were, and who did not do their history. All that accumulated in my mind. All of that played a role in why I got involved. And then the same thing happened when I went to college. The kind of differential treatment, the lack of resources, the lack of support, and the story goes on and on. And you know that, okay? And these ladies have also shown me what, what it is, okay? And also to what it is to be a Chicana, a woman who happens to be of color. There's a different treatment that we receive. We're ignored, even when we make good, uh, we were talking to someone that we make a suggestion and, and they listen to you and then they go all around and then the guy over here makes the same suggestion and it's credited to the guy, right? Now, I love guys, but this, this is not <laughs> what I like, okay? So that shows you why we have to assert ourselves and I know we're raised many, many good parents. You should be humble. You should be this. You should brag about yourself. I have struggled with that myself. But I'm now at my, at my young age. <laughs> uh, I'm learning that you do have to talk about your accomplishment. Okay? As you, not because you're, because you see, even now I, I have a problem, right? So called talking about the things I've done because you've got to show others that it's possible, that you can make it, and you can even make it better than, than I did. I hope to see all of you do much more better than ever I'll be able to accomplish, because we do have the talent, we do have the know-how, we do, we just need to believe in ourselves and to remember what my parents taught me. The most valuable thing in this universe is a human being, and we got to do whatever we can to protect that dignity, okay? So that's how I got it all. <laughs> Thank you, Maureen. And it's very important that you're talking about this because that's actually our next question. Uh, we wanted to ask each and every one of you about your roles and how you played um, an important role in the movement through the Brown Berets, the Bio Free Clinic, Alita Zeslan, helping students get their education and public housing. So we'll start off with you, Gloria, please. That's a lot. <laughs> Good question. Um, you know, it, it just came with the youth. You know, we were youth at that time, you know, far from that now. But uh, we were just discovering our, our power, really. You know, being reborn again as an activist. But not really knowing that, we, I mean, we just did that kind of thing. We went to every protest, march. We had a, um, uh, one time in, in the clinic, we had a, a hunger strike for the inmates at the, the glass house over here. Not the glass house, the other one. What's the other one called? Um, um, yes, yes, the county. And um, 
I mean, we took on all of these causes for education, for health, for housing, for lack of jobs, for, um, you know, just poverty in general. Um, and we took on all of those issues and we were at everything we could go to, to to protest the treatment, to make it better. And I always tell young people, you stand on the shoulders of giants because they died for you, they got beat up for you, they were arrested for you. And, you know, what you have now, take advantage of it because I didn't. I didn't have the opportunity to go to college. We couldn't afford it in those days. And when I had the clinic, uh, here we were surrounded by medical professionals, technicians, nurses, doctors, counselors, um, social workers, and we provided these services to people. And to get those services, people were afraid of us as brown bears. So we went into the community, knocked on doors, said, hi, we're here to tell you there's a free clinic. People couldn't believe. You're giving me something free that's connected. No, no. They wouldn't open their doors. They were afraid of us. So it took a long time to build that confidence from the community for what we were doing. And we had regular pediatri pediatrician come and take care of kids. We had every kind of discipline of health. And if we didn't have it, we got first priority treatment at the county hospital and the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the neighborhood clinic, from the county clinics. People were afraid to go because of their, their um, um, immigration status, okay? Um, and we made sure that nobody would intimidate them. When I would ask for you know, them to fill out an application, all I wanted was their name, their, their age, and uh, their, you know, their gender, okay? They were afraid to give me information. I said, I don't care if you put your name as Mickey Mouse. I don't care. All I want is, is statistics to know how old you are and you know, uh, your age, because I got grants you know, providing that information. I never accepted any government funds for the Arctic Clinic. Uh, now it's, uh, people will tell me, that's your clinic, they're the ultimate. You know, um, I went there one time and they treated me like dirt. I went over there to visit when they were on Bonnie Gray, and I said, I, when it started, I worked with the clinic, you know, I did not start it, it was David Sanchez, but he asked me to run it, and I was not interested because I know, I'm not interested in that book. And, uh, he says, well, I'm commanding you to run it. So I did, and it became my baby. It became, you know, I really took pride in that clinic. And it ran well, it reached people, it served people. The county did everything I asked for. They gave me uh, dance, go to the housing project. They're knocking on the doors. Tomorrow we're going to be here giving immunizations for kids. You'll have a card to take to school. And we take a doctor and a nurse, and we provide these health services for people. They normally wouldn't get them just going into county hospital or to the regular health centers around. So, um, a lot of people that were volunteers in the clinic, all these young people, a lot of them became professionals. I, I, I remember one time walking someplace to a store, and the same man came up to me, and I can't remember his name, and he just said, I remember him, you know, I thought, what are you doing now? He goes, well, I'm a psychiatrist now. If it wouldn't have been for the free clinic and you, I would not be who I am this day. So that's a great honor to know that you reach somebody. But I, at the same time, I said, I didn't take advantage of that. And I didn't go to school. And I didn't become you know, whatever I wanted to be in a career. But I am glad that I stayed grassroots because I will never forget what it feels like to be grassroots and to deal with professionals because sometimes it's difficult, you know. So I am proud of that. But, you know, that's a legacy I leave for my grandchildren and my sons. For me, when I was going to East LA College, I, uh, like I said, I majored in Mexican American studies, and then that's when I found out more about my culture, my roots, and so forth. And to be proud that I was a Mexican at that time, the word Chicana was, I don't even remember it. But anyway, um, what ended up happening when I joined the Brown Berets was that, um, yes, we were militant, and, and Gloria taught, especially the women, about leadership and being proud to be a Chicana. And then, um, 
all of a sudden I heard this little gossip that you're being infiltrated by the FBI or the or the LAPD. And then I was like, I don't know if I want to be here. So then um, I ended up joining Mecha. And then with Mecha, I learned to be, to, to, they, get, they helped me to get inspired of my education. And then so um, I remember uh, there was other student groups, La Vida Nueva and so forth. And then I remember reading the, the, the Raza Unida newspaper and so forth. And I was like, I think I'm on the right road, Elena. So then what ended up happening was that I wanted to get more involved. And then I remember somebody had mentioned to me about the Ben Sereno Brigade, and that meant to um, to go to Cuba and join Che Guevara and, and Fidel Castro. And I said, I'm going to do that, okay? I want to do that. But then when I found out that the FBI was infiltrating them, I was like, I don't think so. Because what ended up happening was that they said that you would have to disconnect from your family. And at that time, my son was seven years old. And there was no way I was going to disconnect from him. So anyway, what ended up happening is I got more involved. And I remember uh, some of the machistas at East LA College said, Elena, you need to run for student government. I go, what? I don't want to be those uh, uh, yuppie people or whatever. They didn't use the word yuppie then. But anyway, um, I ended up, uh, they, Becha helped me to become the first Chicana vice president, student vice president there at ELAP. And it was an experience. The majority of, 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 of people on the, on, the, on the student body, they didn't uh, uh, take me serious because like I said, I had the mechitas behind me you know, push this, push that, and so forth, stuff like that. And I don't think the men in, in, in the student body took me, took me serious. So then I ended up transferring to Cal State, and then that's when I, uh, it was uh, Chicano Studies, it changed to Chicano Studies. And through Chicano Studies, I, I learned about how important our education is, and that it was especially important to to share with our young people how important our education is. And I also learned that we had indigenous roots. And then I was like, indigenous roots? What the heck does that mean? So then anyway, <clears throat> I had heard that Gloria was more into the indigenous roots and so forth. So every now and then I would go to listening to her speak and so forth, you know, supporting her. And then um, I remember telling my mom, Mom, somos indios? And she, she said, oh, don't ever say that. And I go, why? She goes, no, mija, we are Mexicans, Americans. And I go, Mexican, Americans? What the heck is that? So then anyway, I learned that Mexicanos were brought up to be ashamed of their indigenous roots. Okay, so, oh, especially if you were uh, morena. And my sister happened to be morena. That was, you know, her her. Piel Canela uh, uh, skin. And then so I learned that we have been so brainwashed regarding our culture, our tradition, our upbringing, and so forth. And that's for, for me, I made sure that I taught my children that they have rights and that they have choices of being whatever they chose to be. My son now. I'm, I'm so proud of him. He became a special ed teacher. His wife is a teacher. And, and so for me, it's like, uh, it's very important, you know, to, to teach your children that they have rights and that um, the best thing to do is to continue their education so then like this, you know, they could make their lives better. Thank you. What I became involved with was again with what I, I just finished down here. Um, I was uh, in college. Uh, I wanted to be a history teacher, and obviously I think you know why. And I found out that uh, 
well, Chicano, now we call ourselves Chicano, because Chicano at one time was about four letter word, as you know, okay? <laughs> and we were really killed because we were born here and we didn't speak proper Spanish and we didn't speak proper English. So we were, you know, we were messed, they kept us going back and forth and problem of identity and, and pride. I became involved when I heard that my president kept wanting to be a teacher that the dropout rate for Raza was 60%, and that we lost 60% of those, the, the, the dropout rate was 60%, and we lost those students from junior high to high school. And so me wanting to be a teacher, I then thought, gee, that's terrible. And then about the same time, I heard that there was a, that the Los Angeles County Human Relations Commission was organizing and forming a, co a committee, a series of committees. And one of them dealt with education. And it had it had a Mexican American Education Committee and it had an African American, well, what we now call African American Committee. And it had comparable ones for jobs, etc. So I joined the one as a college student, mm -hmm. the one that dealt with Mexican American and the drop rate. And there was Marco de Leon, who, in case you don't know, and here again, we don't know our own heroes. And, and you know, Marco de Leon was, the, was a teacher in, I uh, believe, Van Nuys High School. And he was an anthropologist by profession. And he taught us the concept that finally clicked in my mind, being bilingual and by culture and the effect that it had on the individual. And that the school system did not understand that. And there just should be a curriculum that should help that child transition from one or the other at the same time maintaining it, the culture that is that is yours and the value of language and what it does to the human being. That it's an identity, it's their self-identity, being knowing that language. And he taught us the positive things from an anthropologist's point of view of the value of being by culture and by language. So we decided this committee that had Marco de Leon, Phil Montes, uh, in case you know, eventually Phil Montes ended up being the United States Civil Service Commission director. And other, and talking about Chicanas, Jerry, Jerry Zapata was a, a member of that committee, a very incredible woman who was in part, part besides my mother, she was really one of my mentors for me. Um, and there was Lilian Aceves, which is another woman. I mentioned women that most of us don't know. And they were active women who were, for me, as a young college student, I had never met such articulate and well-informed and the Leoneras of the good kind, you know? And, and, and we organized and we went before the Board of Education and we protested and we were rather controversial. We also recommended not only that kind of a curriculum, but that we hire teach the parents. <laughs> the union was shocked. What? They're gonna undermine our education. They're gonna eventually take over our classes. We're gonna downgrade our children's curriculum. Okay? But we fought because we were not going against the teacher union because the teacher union were very angry at us. Okay, we were gonna misplace them, we were gonna lower their, their salary. We were not that at all. We just wanted parents because we value parents in the classroom. We thought that parents could help the teacher understand that child, okay? And so we brought them in and out of that, now what do you have? Parents that are being hired in the, in the school, right? Well, those were the pioneer people who fought for bilingual a bilingual curriculum for parents in the classroom and, and hiring them eventually they became they first started calling a paraprofessional. Eventually they got the titles of parents aides, etc. And then they also helped the, the, the teacher, I mean the beautiful value of things. But they were fought, but we fought and fought and it happened. Okay. So that's how I when I started on the basis of education. And as I started doing that, came the property programs. And, I, and my role, was, I, 
I, I had never run a program. I was still a college student, and they didn't have software, they didn't have enough Mexican to run some of these programs. So guess what? I ended up being one of the, well, I was the first poverty director in the San Fernando Valley. But how tragic, how tragic, okay? Because poverty existed there, it, is, it exists now. But the best weapon, and I truly believe this, the best weapon against poverty is education. You can take you from living in limitation. I was just talking to someone about the crisis that we face today, and that is in housing. Now you think of a house as well, bricks and, and walls and you know plumbing and all that, mm -hmm. but a house is more than a house. A house is where human beings live. A house is where a child has needs a little corner to be able to study. A house is where a husband and wife live together and raise children. So it's not just a building, it's very personal. And our families, I can tell you, they rent rooms, rooms for close to a thousand dollars. Think about it, one room for a family with children. That's not an exaggeration. That's a very day life that is happening right now, this moment, this second. And we haven't done anything for that population. We talk about it, but talk is cheap. To do something is harder and more, and you have to be so persistent. And that's where we didn't give up. And I think, and, and it was important because I didn't do it all by myself. I have wonderful people. Some of you are here. I've known you all my life. <laughs> and we gotta think that way too. We gotta be united. We talk about it all the time. We have all kinds of yells about it, of cheer, cheers, and they're good. I want them because I too picketed it. I too was involved in the things that that at that time was not popular among our community. And some of you know it, our family used to say, oh, well, thank God my, my parents never kept me away from picketing. But some parents did get that. And they said, why you have tan escandalosa? Que no sabes que te van a castigar. Que eso no es bueno para que tú te hagas de chismes. They give me two words that I hate so much. Todo este chismes de las viejas. Okay, you know? But you cannot, you cannot let that, you cannot let that get you from participating in making justice real. Not just phrases, but real, okay? And so that's where I became involved, okay? And other, other things, obviously, that I, you know, that's how we ended up having a community college in the Northeast Valley. It was going to be going to Northridge, the White Valley. Okay, and when we heard about it, we decided, no, we need one right here in the center of where Vasa is, where the poor live. And so we fought hard, believe me, we fought hard. Okay, and we won. And now you have a community college in Silmar that serves the people of that area. And guess who the dominant student body is? We are. We are in producing, thank God, young men and women who were utilizing their God-given talents. And that's what, again, goes to the basic thing. We've got to respect a human being. They should never be subject to those kind of conditions. That demoralizes the dignity of a human being. And that's my most, my most motivating factor, who we are. We are precious. We are precious, and if you're religious to God, and you're religious, and you're precious to our society, and we want a society that has educated rasa, and that is how I keep on being involved. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Irene, and thank you, Elena and Gloria, for your inspirational words and motivation to let us know how active you are today even. Um, we're gonna open up to, um, since we have a good crowd of people here, we're gonna open it up to uh, questions if anyone wants to come up.
Yeah, you always criticize me, Carlos, but I, uh, I've i done a lot of things and I just want to give some credit to some of these women uh, because I think Irene's a tremendous teacher. Definitely, we should know about Marcos de Leon and how he in, helped integrate in 1925 a white high school when he was 14 years old. But that's the other story. Irene is a history teacher and she's right when she says she doesn't she doesn't talk about herself all that much. But she's told me some things, like how in 1960 they went to a Chicano professor and asked, start a group, help us start a group of Chicanos, and was pulled out. I won't mention it unless you was the <laughs> professor. But when it started, she was involved with it. When I got out of college and started getting into the movement, there was a big, uh, there was a big right-wing liberal fight over education. On the Board of Education, the right way came up against Reagan and all of them against the walkouts and stuff. And, uh, but there was another election, Junior College Board of Trustees. And we had a Chicana on that running for Junior College Board of Trustees that came up pretty high. And there was two, there was a liberal Jerry Brown and there was a right wing Mark in Kennedy. But up there near the top of not getting elected was Irene Tobac. So she was been fighting for that junior college and all that education. And when the Chicano Studies program started at Northridge, who was there working with the community? Irene Tovar. And she and her sister, Ramona, Yolanda's sister too, was uh, representing the valley in the Chicano moratorium. But when the ship came down, <laughs> when we had a press conference to protest there was Irene Tovar right in the front thing, and also Alicia Escalante, somebody also to mention. And the person that organized for people for, from out of town and probably the best organizer, but we didn't really realize it, was Gloria Ariana. She also doesn't talk about all the things she's a part of. And uh, so, many, so many others. But I also wanted to remember when we first started organizing the committee, there was a Brown Beret women came to the meetings. Uh, Gracie and, uh, and Hilda and, and some of the others were at those meetings, but there was also, um, gosh, now I forget names. <laughs> but one of the, the, the sister, the half sister of uh, the, the Zoot Suit person that got arrested was on our committee. I remember she was the head of All Nations Community Center against along with other people from those generations. And I, I really, Irene can tell us about those people, not about her parents, but some of those other people. So please, Irene, can you tell us about some of those struggles? Some of the... Some of us on campus, oh, on, you know, to organize what you guys did uh, for the Vietnam War, uh, for example, the more yeah. 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 And I, for you. I didn't want to take if you want to keep it. Are you sure they're Chicana? <laughs> one, of, one of the things, again, the same thing over and over again. Our men were dying, okay? Our men were dying, and yet they could not bury, be allowed to the military. <laughs> and so we were indignant. Okay, we were indignant that our men were dying and there was poverty, lack of education, of job opportunity, college student education. And we decided, we, and I'm talking about the moratorium, uh, that we were going to protest that war. First of all, for, for the reason that it was not a fair war and us getting involved, but second, how we, as Chicanos or Mexicanos, were not even having rights and yet our men were dying in the fields for this country. So we organized and we live in the valley. And I think I heard you, I told everybody that my sister and I were baptized and so was my brother. Uh, the truth is, this is a side information, but we organized in the San Fernando Valley because often you think when you think about Chicano or Raza, you think about East LA, 
with his son Yash, not relation, in the San Fernando Valley. And he wanted to be part of a united front regarding the war, you know, Vietnam War. So my sister and I, my Mona, my Ramona, that was my sister who was no longer with us, was working in an organization called Joint Ventures. And she was responsible for the youth program. And I was involved at, at, on the campus at CESA. Uh, and so we decided that we were going to see how we could organize all of the young people and, and our families too in regards to that. And I remember at that time, it was not popular, at least in my valley, that we got involved in those kind of activities. You know, they they para que, they, para que them with us in eso, no es propio, you know, the same things I've told you before. So we organized ourselves, and my sister dealt with the young people, and I also related that to the campus season. And we decided that we would form a committee that would deal specifically with that. And before the moratorium, the big moratorium, we had a march ourselves in the valley to rally the young people and the families, because we wanted to be sure that we also involved those families, that it wasn't just the young people that were involved. And we became tremendously involved in that effort. And then we joined with the National uh, Chicano Moratorium. Mm -hmm. We had meetings here in, in East LA. Uh, there were sub meetings. They came, the youth program with my sister came during during the week, and we, I, mean, I came as a delegate also once a week on Mondays, was it not yesterday? We came every, I came every Monday to those meetings and we would take the information back. Well, the, we also, and I'm doing a short, short uh, episode, a description of what happened because there was a lot of movement, a lot of activities. We were, like you said, the FBI, uh, when we went to the meetings, they were there and we had police. Um, pretending to be part of the effort, even, uh, you know, what we were trying to do, just to get information. And we did end up being in the, in the, in the list, because later on, I'll tell you how I found out that I was also, and some of us were in the, um, the unwanted list of the FBI nationally. But going back to our activity, what happened, we volunteered to host the Texas delegation that was going to participate in the moratorium because we came from every state in the South, you know, every state. And there were Chicanas who participated in those efforts, let me tell you. And often we don't think about them. Thank God for these ladies right here. Thank God for them and their dedication to that effort because it was not easy and there were dangers, they were courageous. They took on a system that was so anti-Mexican and anti-Latino. Okay? So we hosted the Texas delegation. So we were responsible for finding housing during the time that they would be here for the march. And so we ended up ensuring that the day of the march that we provided buses for to bus up over here, including our own families. We were we were here that this was a family event, that this was not going to be, you know, a battle because we had to negotiate with the sheriff. The sheriffs knew everything that we were doing. They knew our route. They knew that we were going to be peaceful and, and our march. And it had been. It had been up to that very moment of the incident. But let me go back to Texas <laughs> delegates. We housed them in the morning of the march at Las Palmas Park. We had breakfast. We provided them with breakfast. They got on the bus and we brought them in. Now, I was delegated to be the cleanup person. <laughs> or in the sense that I had to get other people to work with me. I wasn't the only one. So I did stay back and I was going to join them later. So we to keep the park clean because they had loaned us that morning to house the Texas delegation. So we took, I believe it was three or four buses. Uh, most people, not only the Texas delegation, but our own community, that the Reese, who is very well liked and respected, the Valley was there, Diane Hernandez, who may not mean anything right now to you, but was also one of our young Chicanas who came with us and eventually ended up being having very responsible position 
and being too proud to take a result with that. And we had all of us were joined in that effort. So they, they the buses arrived and the march took place and they were in the park and that that that, 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 that part. And all of a sudden I was coming driving to the dogs and they stopped the, the freeway. They were stuck in the freeway. We couldn't get out through the um, lanes. And I, I couldn't figure out what was happening. And apparently just as I was coming in and they were shutting the freeway, the incident happened that that, that store, you know, the liquor store, where apparently someone had stolen some beer or something, had apparently been used as a reason to then come into the park. And my sister was gassed. They threw uh, gases at we We had to be very concerned about the families that we had brought because they were all scattered. And what happened, there was, um, I'm not a very good uh, sports person, but what is a back, back, what is it they have for a baseball? What do they call it? Okay, well, there was, yeah, there was another uh, uh, a wired fence up, okay? So they pushed many of the families towards that wire so that they could go any other place other than to be up. Some of the other, some of our families were lost in the process. Some were able to get into the buses. And it's, you know, like Mel Toby said, that I'm taking a public transportation to get back to the valley because it was all gathered. And you know the rest. I don't need to describe to you how horrible it was. And but the important thing is that we were united, that we had Chicanas and Chicanos jointly working, that we should have acknowledged more the role of the Chicana in those efforts. Yes, we could have definitely. That we should remember, yes, we should, because it was not pleasant. And so when I am I see Chicanas like you that are now progressing, I think of the effort of these women is worth it because now this is the fruit of what we wanted to develop. This is what we wanted. We wanted young, young Chicanas to succeed. We are proud of you when we see you. We know that what we did or whatever, we call a sacrifice. It was worth the price, okay? And so we encourage every young woman that is here to make sure you encourage other young women. You must be an anti woman. <laughs> <laughs> It was then in the in the late sixties that there were some Chicanos who supported us and who encouraged us to. There's no doubt that it was Alil and who are even this young women right in front of me who were there. <laughs> who were there for us. I know that Salil with all this money, Irene, we need you here. And you know what? It was important that they saw Chicanas and Chicanas together, and it was frightening. There were other activities that was an abuse of what happened to us after that. Unfortunately, and this is the unfortunate part of what happened to the moratorium, some people left us. Some people left the movement because they were afraid, because of what they saw, because some of their members of the family got beaten, or, 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 or something happened to them. Let me tell you the route I took. I decided that maybe I I was not going to march, but I didn't make that decision. I just said, you know what? I'm going to use a different technique. I'm going to use what Tijerina used to say. I was going to get inside of the bow of the animal. And you know what that means? I did go to the system, but I did not go to compliment them. I was going to go there to see where there were opportunities to change the system. 
And the, the reason I'm telling you this is because sometimes I'm disappointed that we select Chicanos or Chicanos to position of, of power. And we're so impressed with our position and we try to protect it that we become part of the system. I'm telling you, don't ever do that. Don't. You can make it, you can make the change. And at this point, I have to talk about myself, I'm sorry. But when <laughs> I talk about the change that occurred, okay, when we opened the state of California, discrimination against Mexicans, and especially Mexicanas, Latinas, we were the lowest paid employees in the state of California. I made sure that that changed. And it did change. Knowingly that I was inside the system, inside the man, as they say, to change, change it. You can make it. Don't betray your cause of the dignity of a human being because of a title. Titles come and go, they're cheap. But to produce something, to use it for change, that is something you have an obligation to do. Otherwise, don't accept titles because then you're a window dressing Mexican. And I always say, I am not a window dressing Mexican. Thank you, Irene. So we have another question here. Um, it's so uh, wonderful to meet all you ladies. Um, you're talking about um, uh, the moratorium and so on. And so I understand that the companion exhibition in here is called Patriotism in Conflict, uh, Fighting for a Country in Comunidad. Was there really a sense of patriotism during that movement? And if so, how would you describe it? Anybody? Thank you. Uh, patriotism, I think it's not to this government or this country. It was to ourselves. And it should be cultural. You know, uh, because we, we learned who we were and we're proud of who we were. Um, you know, and we won't always accept it for what we believed in. Um, you know, I mean, especially at the beginning, it was hard. You know, I remember going uh, to a rally at East LA Stadium, and it was some kind of religious gathering, so there was families there. And we were sent to pass out flyers, and we were told, do not argue with anybody, okay? And I handed a flyer to this man, and he had his family, a large family. And he read it and he was cheap, kind of. He brought it up and he threw it at me. All of me wanted to get it and say, you know, throw it back at him, you know, but I, I bit my tongue and I said, okay, 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 you know, I can get through this. And I just took it. And I had to take his yelling at me and insulting me. And I never forgot that, you know. And one of the things we were telling the Brown Boys was we were like a tree. And if, if you didn't know your roots, you wouldn't survive. A tree will not survive without roots. So that was embedded in me, you know, about being cultural, always being proud of who you were. Um, you know, when we sang de colores, different songs like that, you were proud, you know, and you were just proud to be a Chicano or a Chicano. And, uh, you know, while everybody didn't identify with that, you know, especially families from Mexico, they did not like the word. Okay, it was offensive to them. And, you know, it survived. And, you know, now we're called all kinds of things, you know. Um, you know, China, Chicana X, Chicana X, uh, Latin X, you know, all this and that. There's a lot of uh, argument about that. Some like it, some don't like it. Um, you know, it's just, it keeps changing constantly. But what I do see is people are finding their indigenous roots. And that's why I see the prophecy of the eagle and the condor coming together, okay? It's starting to merge, okay? It was a battle before, it was a battle. 
or you're American Indian, or you're Mexican. You know, it's not just Mexican now. It's Honduras, it's Salvadorian, Salvadorian uh, Guatemalans. You know, it's very diverse now. And we have to think as one. We have to think as one. Okay, and that I see there's still some resistance to it. Okay, but I see Native Americans because I am part of that community also, that it is coming together. I have, um, after the moratorium, you know, I worked so hard at the moratorium, and when I got tear gas, all I remember is somebody pulling me and putting me on the bus, put a wet t-shirt on my face, because I couldn't breathe. It was horrible. It's the most horrible. I'd rather have 10 babies or cesarean than <laughs> go through gas, tear gassing again. Um, and, but somebody saved me, and I, I don't know who it was, you know. And then Corky Gonzalez, as a bus driver, was just panicking, trying to get out of that parking lot. Um, Corky Gonzalez and his entourage came and they wanted to open the door, and the, man, the driver would say, No, no, get out, get out, get out. They forced the doors open, they came in. And then he stopped and he looked around and he says, No, I don't belong here. And he wanted to get out, and the man didn't want him to get out. The doors are locked, and they forced the doors out. But well, he got arrested that day, you know. But, um, you know, there was so much panic that day, and so many stories that I've heard afterwards. But for me, we went back to the office on uh, what is now Susan Chavez Boulevard, and we could see the smoke going up. And we didn't know what was going on. We were listening to the radio and getting all these news reports. And then they bought a young man in that his leg was wrapped in bubbles, and they do that, the paramedics do that when they've broken something, or possibly. And they left him there in the office, and, you know. And so there was a lot of chaos, a lot of chaos. I disappeared the next day. I went home and I never went back to East LA for 40 years. Okay? Um, people say, did you go to the meeting? No. no. I went to the funeral of Ben Ward, who was the youngest man, the young man that was killed that day. And he was from El Monte. And he was a brown boy. And there was a lot of brothers in this family. And I went to the funeral, and I was a little late. So when I drove up, people were at the graveside already, the families and you know supporters. And there was detectives in the bushes taking pictures. And that kind of just did it for me. I said, I am done. I am gone. I went away for how many years. And Los Leo brought me back. He called me and said, you know, they were going to do commemorative. And I was like, well, I'm a different person now. I have went back to school, I got had my two sons, I uh, went to my indigenous roots, I was active in my tribe, and he called me and he said, we'd like you to have, come back, you know, and I said, I'm a different person now. And he did not give up on me, thank goodness, okay? Uh, but I told him, I told him, what is it you want? He goes, well, can we use your name? Like, oh yeah, you can use your name, I don't have a problem with that. And then he kept on, I go, what else do you want? He goes, can we use your picture? And I go, absolutely. You know, and that's a picture where there's three women, uh, Hilda Reyes and myself, and uh, is it Hilda? Uh, uh, Gracie? Gracie. Yeah, Gracie, Gracie, okay. And we're carrying crosses because that was the day after we left the robberies and we had planned to be in that moratorium in the rain with the uh, trenzas, black uh, shawls, and carrying across a Vietnam soldier that had been killed. And um, uh, it was so, just, it traumatized me to know that people got killed at the military. And here I was a person that advocated for the use of guns to protect myself and, and my community. And when I saw death, it just was something that, no, no, I can't do that. You know, my kids were not allowed to use squirt guns. Anything that looked like a weapon, they were not allowed to play with those things because I am so anti-gun now, so anti-violence. Um, you know, I just don't believe in it anymore. I did as you, and I'm mature, and I'm responsible for other lives, the children, and you know, community. I, I, there's too much gang violence. You know, drive-by shootings of innocent children, and families. So, um, you know, those are things we still need to work on. And I don't see it getting better, you know. And I see a lot of things that we fought for being undone. Immigration, the dreamers, you know, people not being allowed to take advantage of educational opportunities when they come here, not because they chose to, but because they were part of their family that came here. 
the immigration, I mean, people choose these, uh, you know, the people that have the little carts that sell food. That really hurts me to see that thing happen to those people. You know, that hurts. Um, people will buy it, but they'll destroy their carts, which is their livelihood. You know, and I, I just, you know, anyways, there's a lot of things I don't like these days, you know, but <laughs> I do what I can. And I want to tell you that I went back to Cal State LA for two days where uh, they had a reunion of Gomas and Mecha students from way back then. And Vicky Castro was one of the uh, co, co uh, organizers and uh, Felix Guterres. And I would hear them talking, I was like, yes. They were amazing. I learned so much more. I thought the movement started with the Brown Boys. I honestly did. But no, there was a whole other kind of organization going on. I learned about some groups that I had never heard about. And, you know, did some research and I found out there was a lot going on before, you know, I was a really bitty bopper coming in as a teenager, you know. And um, uh, I saw people, they get a, a Honoring of Chicano elders. Now, we do that in the Native community quite frequently. We always honor our elders. But to do Chicanos was the first time I heard about it. And he, they brought in so many people from the past that it was incredible. I just loved being in that environment for two days. And uh, it was very exhausting. And I got to tell you about my, my, the one class they gave me to put on, it was for community organizing. So. We had, you know, props and things like that from uh, my collection. Everything I had from the Brown Boys, I donated to Cal State LA. It's because that's where it belongs. Because people were coming to my house, I'd look at my toads, can I get pictures? And I said, people deserve to have this. So I gave it to Cal State LA. And uh, uh, I lost my thought here. I'm uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Oh, the, school, the class I had, they said, your, your room will be 42 participants. We bought in four schools uh, by the busloads, you know, teenagers. So I got mostly teenagers and some professors and some casting students. And I'm looking at maybe a third of the students like this on the desk. So, oh boy, this is going to be challenging. You know, so I go and I'm giving my speech, you know, they look at their heads fine. And then this young man, <laughs> They were sharing my letter of resignation that we sent to Arun and Letsia up in Redwood City, Brown Birds, when we went and resigned. Because what they were saying was that they, we were kicked out. No, I had a letter that showed that we were resigning and why we were resigning. And I always signed my letters with Maria Arianes, but I would put Conche, Conche Guevara, who was one of our you know, heroes. And, um, <laughs> Um, this young man, he raises his hand and says, I have a question. I go, you got a question? What, what's your question? How old are you? And I hear, ah! <laughs> So I, I go, what am I, how am I going to tell this kid, okay? So I said, I'll tell you how old I am if you tell me what relevance does that have to community organizing? And he got kind of like this and teaches, I apologize, I'm so sorry. I go, no, he has a question. That's okay. He didn't ask me that. I'm going to tell him. But he has to answer me first. You know, so he, he just kind of like, no. You know, he says, you know, what is it? They say teenagers don't have the capacity to think things through. He didn't think things through, very obviously. And then uh, I told him, I'm 76. Oh, I go, why is that important to you? I don't know. <laughs> So I know the teacher was going to chew him out the next day. I know he was in trouble. You know, but um, you know, I'm happy to be back in the community. You know, I mean, with Rosalio, he brought me back for the community relations. But I have stayed in touch, and I have the blessing to be able to go to the Native community and the Chicano community. And you know, I'm comfortable in both. So um, you know, and that's something that we need to learn how to do because it, you know, has come a very long way and it's on its way. We didn't create those borders. We migrated back and forth. My family on my dad's side came from Chihuahua. My mom was always in, in uh, the Southern California area, uh, the Los Angeles basin, and uh, Pasadena specifically. Uh, so 
I just want to say, you know, it's good to be back in the Chicano community. And I now identify as a Chicana, as a Tonga slash Chicana elder. That's my identity. Because in those 40 years that I went away, I was denying my history, my own personal history, and I came back to claim my history. And it's part of me. And it makes me who I am. Because I went on the Poor People's Campaign, and I want to tell you, people don't talk about the People's Campaign or Poor People's Campaign. But I think on that trip, a state a day on a bus with six brown brain men sitting at the back of the bus near the toilet, um, <laughs> got right back there. Um, I learned more than any university or book could have taught me about people. And this is why I love my grassroots teachings and learnings. Um, I saw more poverty that I couldn't believe in this country that claim to be the richest country in this world. Um, no, uh, people don't have running water, gas, electricity. It still exists today on reservations for like the Navajo people, the large reservations. 40% of the people do not have running water, gas, or electricity. And then it made me feel like, I, I go to a sundown ceremony, and there's nothing. You take in your own water, you use a port pot And one year it was a car hood for the door, another year it was a parachute for the United town. Don't fall over there, because it's a car to you know, they bounce off. Um, but I'm glad I got to see that. That's reality. Okay, it's shocking. Okay. And to see kids suffering in the Appalachians, you know, it's unbelievable. So that's a part of my story. I'm going to answer that question. I think it's a very, very important question. Patriotism, you know, and versus activism. Um, again, I go back to our our so-called founding fathers, okay? Uh, they believe that we, and there's a very famous um, phrase that, uh, that indicate that we are all equal, that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now that includes your right to protest, that includes your right to speak. It denies, therefore, your citizenship or your loyalty to this country. Our men have died of their rights, which is part of what we are guaranteed in this country. So it's a very important question because many times we've been thrown that quotes, they're not American. Well, they're not loyal to this country. Our men have died for this country. We've, played, we've been part of the richness of this economy because one example is a, is a pandemic. Who were the ones that carried through cheap labor and hard work, dangerous to their health, and yet you cannot call them that they, our country, our people have not contributed to being loyal, loyal, to this country. When I picketed, it, when I joined against the Vietnam War, I was doing what every American of every color, of every religion believe has a right to under the Constitution of this United States. We got to know our rights and don't ever, ever feel that you're less of an American if you criticize something that a politician is doing a law that is being proposed that can damage our, our community, you are even more American because you're really following the most important thing in a democracy, and that is called participatory, participatory democracy. That means we have a responsibility, let me underline responsibility, to participate in making this country better. And it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter what religion you believe in, or not believe in any religion, okay? You're still a patron as long as you don't kill someone without reason. Boy, I mean, she owns, don't quote me on that one. That was a slick 
on the tab. <laughs> you just edit that. Good evening, my name is Ramona. Hola, Ramona. Um, I would like to hear thoughts on the current situation where there's been an effort to include in educational curriculum a representation of all of the people of this country and what I would like to believe is an effort to include more accurate information of the history of this country and everybody in it. How that has turned into governments passing laws that are banning what they're terming as critical race theory in the school settings. I'm sorry. <laughs> So currently, there's been this effort to reform educational curriculum to include representation of all the people that live in this country and include a more accurate history of everyone in this country. And that has gotten turned into governments naming that critical race theory and then banning inclusion of everybody's story in the schools in their states. But the only way I can answer that you're talking about, if you're talking, this is what I wanted clarification. If we're talking about ethnic studies, uh, the yes. state might you know, and I was part of defending ethnic studies, and I organized a statewide term, uh, coalition to ensure and protect ethnic studies because we wanted to be taught to every child, irrespective of their own background. In other words, ethnic studies, usually we think about them African-American for African-American, Chicano studies for Chicano, uh, indigenous for indigenous with a little base rap for the beginner. But this this new effort was to make sure that every child from elementary on all up, even in college, in college even we asked for two units uh, of the group but the equilibrium the equilibrium equilibrium of six units that in undergrad and he take the order to graduate. Okay. So we are in support well but people about that fought for it uh, met with opposition, by the way. So, you know, there was opposition to it. They wanted to, to make sure that certain things were, who, who wrote a curriculum, that some union, teacher unions disputed that because they thought they should have the right to write the, the curriculum and not the legislature. And the legislature wanted to write, write the coalition. It became a very, uncomfortable battle, okay? But but it did pass, and I understand that as of next year, college students will have to take two units of ethnic studies irrespective of whether they're Chicano, white, or black, or whatever color they are, okay? So I do support that kind of, of uh, teaching from K through to the college level, but I, I want you to know that the reason that it's so important and in a way, it goes back to the thing about patriotism. We used to be called unpatriotic by the Republicans, okay? Or And yet right now, who are the ones that are most challenging what rights everybody has in this country, okay? We gotta face the racism that has flourished under the previous administration, and that we more than ever have to be supportive of each other and reach, reaching as coalition, as members of different ethnic groups, that we know that we're the target. And those that claim themselves to be Americans have turned against the very foundation rules of this country that we all have rights, irrespective of race, color, or creed. Okay? So I I do support that effort. That's your question. Okay? It wasn't, but that's okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I assumed that you were in support of it because that's what you were talking about. But what your intention, while it may be a law in California, has turned into all of these other states where the government has actually, they're taking what you fought for, and, and I don't mean you personally, but you, you and everybody yeah. else fought for, and turned it into what they're calling critical race theory and then making laws in the states that are banning the teaching of critical race theory which is it which was never the intention anyway so I just so so no okay i just answered what i know in the state of california i have no other than to say yes i hope the other states also support it that's about all i can say in relation to that okay thank and you i guess I, I think what she's asking is about like what to do about this backlash oh. like when the things you fight for and so is that like what's one of the things you fight for and kind of okay. get undone? Okay, one beginning with one very simple thing that doesn't take too much time vote. Vote. Okay? 
that is one weapon that we don't even fully appreciate in terms of how powerful it is. If we as citizens really, really wanted to fight that, we would definitely go. Because what is the opposition to the racist want to do? To keep the minorities from voting. They're even you know, I was in a commission, a redistricting, okay? They, well, that's what a racist makes a, a, a district appear and divide a community, a minority community, so they take away their power through the vote because of how they divide the district. That's a, I think most of you understand how we can come into much about redistricting, but that's a very important thing. But we cannot give up our right to vote. I, and think about it, you know, you can even vote at midnight in the privacy of your own home. It only takes a little time. I already voted, by the way. I hope you've already voted. That is what thing you can start doing to answer her question to how to fight it. Okay? The other thing is to speak against that kind of racism. Okay? It's uncomfortable. I'll tell you, I've met some very nice people who do not like to talk about racism, who do not know that in order for us to correct it, we got to face it. Okay? But that's going to be what many of us are going to have to fight it. That's another example of the fight. Okay? And there's other things. Don't undermine, don't underestimate your power. Your power, call. Call your state senator, call your, your council people. Get on that phone. It only takes a little time. You spend more time on that darn cell phone. <laughs> okay? You know? So take the time and vote. And call and make it. And make the best. Right? You organize. Your, even your little neighborhood. I tell everybody when I'm doing a voter registration drive, just call 10 people. And ask each of those 10 people to call 10 more. And then more. And before you know it, you just make 10 calls, but you start a whole chain. And it may take you maybe maybe 30 to maybe an hour to do those 10. I know I've done that. So you can do it too. So that's part of, part of your answer. Thank you, Irene. And I'm glad that you're saying that because on top of it, it's not just about voting. It's also about uh, being engaged in other um, campaigns, but also in particular purple and red states. Mm -hmm. Getting people to register to vote, making sure that Democrats are voting, that's another way of doing that as well. So I want to echo that. Or if you're not able to donate your time, you can also uh, provide funding. So that's another way to, to get involved. So Green is a very good color. <laughs> <laughs> Go All right. Um, we have two more questions. Uh, one in the back. Yes. Uh -huh. I don't know if I misunderstood, but in the, morning, in the beginning of uh, the, this class, I guess that's what I'm calling I think there was something about a writing group. Uh, I, I want to know about, sure. more about that, um, how it okay. started. Sure. 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 That's for, Is it still going on? For Elena. Uh, Elena. She's, yeah, she's wondering about the. Um, uh, Chicana, uh, Cholas, and Chisme uh, writing group that you are part of, which is part of Casa 101. Yeah, they just, oops, oops. they just recently had a play, and it was so, it was so, it was great because uh, it was about Chinese, I mean, uh, Japanese Americans and, and Chicanos in the 50s. Anyway, uh, that show's over, but in June, they're going to have another one. So yeah, it's still going on. And then if you're in, if any of the ladies are interested in joining the writing group, they start organizing in October. So for six months, you're in the group, and then in March, you 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 have your uh, your play uh, exhibited at the Playhouse. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Lana. Thank you for your question. Come on through. Oh, thank you. Hello, my name is Astrid Coda. Um, I'm just really inspired to be here, but my question is more about like um, perseverance and like pushing through the movement because I've personally experienced, um, like I guess because I was young, I just didn't really know how to take care of myself while also being in the movement. And, and one of my great comrades always tells me, you're not helpful to yourself. You're not helpful to the movement if you're not taking care of yourself. So I just want to know like what your breakfast best practices or phrases you say to yourself to, I guess, keep going in vulnerable moments and, and 
like for example like say you just like this happened to me like you know just like protesting back to back and then like going to work and like school and then like you're tired but there's this one other really big event like what do you like what do you like i don't know like what do you how do you recharge i guess <laughs> What I can say is self-preservation is very important because if you're not good for yourself, you're not good for anybody. And I think as you age, um, you start to feel it a lot more. And um, that to me, it's maintaining balance. Okay. I mean, for the last week and a half, I had an event every single day. I opened up the women's reproductive uh, uh, ban on uh, Road versus Lake in downtown LA. I opened up the women's uh, march every year, except for when, during the pandemic. So I reached thousands of people, women especially. And uh, it's so good to see this quote that comes out that when it comes to you, you can, we have to pursue this. We have to, because if you're going to walk us, you're going to get our issues in there. So I know a lot of people try to take it easy. I try myself, you know. Um, I keep saying I'm going to stop. I keep saying that, okay? And then somebody comes and says, hey, would you like to be on <laughs> I say, yes, I'd like to. You know, that sounds good, you know. Uh, there's always so many issues that I have to be addressed with that. You know. so keep a group of supporters around me that will remind you to take care of yourself. And always remember to keep balance. Okay, we want to be here. Okay, and that means learning how to say no. Okay, and choosing what's more important, what's the priority, um, and you know where is it? I mean, I was invited to go up to the mountains in way down near the Bay Area and for uh, a ceremony, and I, you know, I can't sit in a car for ten hours. You know, I was even stopping everything else. I just can't do it anymore. So I realize my limitations now. Yeah. But they can't stop this, they can't stop this, and they can't stop this. Okay? So, and I use spirituality a lot to keep me balanced, you know. And I feel like getting my answers from my ancestors and my, my, my spirits, you know. Um, I never prepare speeches, but they come to me from that area, you know. So, just take care of yourself. And don't let people push you to do things that you're exhausted about, you know. So just choose and so on. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you to Gloria Arianes, Elena Dominguez, Irene Tovar, Dr. Priscilla Leva for being here tonight. We encourage you all to come back and see the exhibition it closes next month on June 19, 2022. And of course, we have in Casa con la Plaza sessions that are occurring uh, this month and a lot of events going on here as well. So we welcome you back and thank you so much for being here.